You would put the end on and then pack this up and mound it up. It's going to shrink. We'll do that Monday or something. You know. Wait a second, one on. One more little bit here. Okay, we're going to call that quits for the compost pile now. But I'll probably try and tweak it before I leave so it does run a little bit. And go to the website and I'll give you a report on the blog about how it's running. But basically, the principles here apply to every system. We can use that, that cow with all the corn stalks in it because that's both the thick structure like the stalky material and the finer structure like the hay all rolled into one. It's an ideal material. You know? um, but it would be even better if we had the time. We had time last night, didn't we, Marshall? <laughs> we did this in the rain last night. To have worked a bunch of stalks in it would be even better. It would have run even better, run longer. You know? But it runs pretty darn well like this. We just made a much better thing. What I don't know about, John, what do you think of my carbon nitrogen ratio? I'm a little worried. But the manure I carry it, I hope, right? Yeah, and um, it would have been nice if we had a hose and we spritzed a little bit each time just to get a little bit of moisture in the layers. Yeah, yeah. See what it, happens here. But I think that there's enough wet in the hay and the, and the manure that they'll eventually yeah. even out, you know? Because the manure, the hay was yeah. quite wet and the manure is quite wet. And then, yeah. uh, remember I said uh, uh, structure, moisture, uh, tight with light, all those kind of things. And and then you then you get into this thing called thermal mass. You gotta have at least bare minimum three by three by three or four by four by four. There has to be enough mass that when the internal organisms get going and breaking and creating breaking things down and creating heat, that there's enough insulation that you get this thermal mass of heat. If you make anything much smaller than this to start, what's gonna happen is it's just gonna peter out because it's so well cooled all the way around it. So this is pretty good thermal mass. You know, get in the front on here so as it breaks down, it doesn't slosh out. Well, and we're gonna pile it up once we get the yeah. other too. Yeah. And then, by the way, if I didn't have a cover, like that fancy cover, what I've done is thatch it with something like straw. Books of straw and make them like make a peak and thatch it, and most of the water will run off, and yet it still will breathe. Yeah. Yeah. It's not ideal, but it's cheaper than that stuff. Okay. I think we're gonna call that it. Okay. So let me segue in. Okay. So um, some people would say. Wow, you know that's an awful lot of work, and you know a lot of thank you. a lot of problem there. But you're making no, this super concentrate. Thank you. And even in the super concentrate, this could be a food for the next step. So one large scale uh, commercial worm casting producer in California that sells to all the vineyards. He has a larger bin, more like those bins. He he puts his manure in there and he aerates and he cooks it about four to five weeks. And then that food, he feeds to the worms, and they take it the rest of the way. So he's getting that first big pathogen kill, and then in, instead of just keep turning and going on, he then feeds it to worms. So this can be worm food also once you get a good pathogen kill. You get and good pathogen kill, it's the best worm bedding. Yeah, so that's the, that's the synergy part. We can start out with this great compost, and we, we have uses for it, but partway through the process, say we had two bins going, we might say, hey, that second bin, we needed some worm food now and that goes into your worm system. And then your worms make another form of compost that has certain elements that this compost won't have and, it, and is your next super concentrate. What we're doing is you do a lot of work to make the super concentrate, then the super concentrate does a lot more work because you can take it out and apply it over great distances. So um, that gets us into the worm casting production. So let's head back over to number three. Is that a snapper? No, I don't think it is. It's a terrapin, I think, or is it? That's a gorgeous turtle. 
Yeah, you climb. Yeah, get as much of it as you can. Oh, I gotta get the other side of the lightning. The big turtle. Worm castings, is that what we're doing next? Yes, and the handout is the notes from the 33010 garden plant. This is actually another whole talk. We're going to use pieces of it, but that, this is a different talk. It's a similar subject, but we're just going to stick to the pieces okay, here. Okay, so why don't we give that and hand it out to people? Well, I hand it out already. They'll have it. Oh, okay. Uh, no. Uh-oh. I don't have it. No, I don't. Wait, I mean, Elmo brought it and I handed him around. Right, right when I came back. Yeah, we handed them right out. Three ten. It's three pages long, stapled. Everyone should no, have it. I did not get. I didn't I get it. Some I didn't I got get the first it either. one, but not yes. the second. No. Well, maybe it didn't get handed out. I might be wrong. I, I, I don't <laughs> He's got them in his hand. hand. We never hand them. That's what I was asking. I see. Yeah, you too. I see. We just wanted to I check. Saw. All right, <laughs> got it. My fault. Pardon me. Here, I'll give this a test. <laughs> Like they all ate them. No. <laughs> no we I got sure them. wanted to hand them out. I guess we were in the middle of talking. I wanted to serve. Them. <laughs> okay. All right. So are we ready? Okay. The best worm to use for this is red wigglers. Okay. There is a little bit of a scare thing going around. You'll see it. It keeps coming back up. And the rap is can't use red wigglers because wigglers because they're invasive and they endanger the forest. The truth is. I responded to Josh Kelly, who put that out there. He's a great you know, forester, and he really is on top of stuff. And I said, Josh, I'd really believe you and worry about it if it wasn't for the fact that I've had a worm boom everywhere I've lived for the past 35 years, and I've always just gathered my red wigglers right outside my yard. I don't think that I'm causing the problem. They're here. you know. And he said, actually, you're right, Pat. What I really don't want people to do is to build worm bed, bring worms in near virgin forest, because then they probably aren't there. And if you bring them in, they will damage the forest. They'll eat up too much carbon. So if you happen to be near a virgin forest, do not use worms. If you're in the rest of our already thoroughly degraded world, the worms are here and they're helping to fix things. And don't worry about it, okay? All right. So I guess I'll talk for a moment, then we'll open it up. Red wigglers are the best worm to use, most easily available. You can buy them, about $25 a pound. I could probably sell them to you if you want to buy them. Um, Maybe even Jafasa can by now, or Mills River Educational Farm, rather. Um, but you can also just gather them. Those piles of, of hay out there that were on the ground, I bet you if we look close, there's worms under there. And it doesn't take many. I mean, the only time I ever bought them was because my employer did not want to wait for them to actually mul multiply. But worms are hermaphrodites, right? Mm -hmm. They both are going to have fertile eggs when they're done mating. So every worm is reproducing. You know? And they lay a bunch of eggs, and they have a real short cycle. So it's not very long before they go from a few to hundreds. And once they're hundreds, they're thousands in no time. They're tens and twenties and hundreds of thousands in a couple of months. So you don't need a lot to start. But if you're in a hurry, you can buy them. And I'll sell them to you. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Yeah, just lift up that way and slide this way. All right. All right, so you make a box. That's my favorite worm bin system is a box. John could talk later on about his favorite system. Um, mine's more small scale, you know. It gives me quality control. Um, I use untreated wood. I try and get oak. This was not made out of oak, but it'll last for a while. Um, my oak boxes have lasted me seven to eight years. You want them tight enough that rodents can't get in. We'll look at how that didn't work over here. Um, if rodents get in, once again, it's just a feeding chamber. Yeah. Um, you then want to fill the box halfway with bedding. What's bedding? Bedding is things like well-rotted straw. That's wonderful. Well-rotted manure. But if you're using well-rotted manure and want to make compost tea, you must be absolutely certain that you're only using the castings. And I actually don't recommend going there because of the scares right now. And because if somebody messes up, it'll hurt us all. So I'd say if I'm going to use it for compost tea, do not use animal manures. You know, well-rotted um, straw, well-rotted stalky material. Um, I used to use cardboard. I kind of stopped because John found out we couldn't. It's not allowed by Armory. Um, I think that's probably a little fussy. I think that whatever's in the cardboard will easily be broken down by the microbes. 
But uh, people know what Armory is. That's the Organic Material Review Institute, and they're the arbiters. You know, the nonprofit, non-governmental arbiters of what's organic. A lot of people rely on them. So I stopped using cardboard, but cardboard was wonderful. Um, paper's okay, but it's even less structure. You want structure once again for air. This box is not real deep because the worms need air. They do better with air. I mean, there are deeper systems. They work, but they do better with air. Worms actually make help to bring air into situations. They help to make them more, anaero more aerobic, less anaerobic. Okay, um, so you get your well rotted bedding. If, you, if you're starting out, what I'd say the first thing you do is go get some straw, you know, get it rotting. As soon as it's rotten enough to do a bioassay, break some up as if it were peat, add some soil, try growing some tomatoes on it, see if they wilt. If they do, you don't want to use that straw, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or find out where your straw came from is the other thing. You, know? you can also just use that stocky material that we just were working with and pile up enough that it mats down and soak it and eventually it'll rot and make good bedding too. You, know? you can buy peat and use peat. That's what Mary Applehoff's book was about. I'm just adverse to buying peat for a worm bin. But if you want to get going in a hurry, it'll get you going. You know? Coffee grounds work kind of. They're okay for bedding. Coconut Ooh. fiber. Coconut fiber is fine. You know? Those kinds of things. High carbon is what these guys live in. They don't live in the soil. If you have a lot of these worms, do not put them in your garden. They're going to go find themselves a pile. They will not stay in your garden. They want to be in piles. They're pile worms. They're not the earthworms, okay? And you can look at it now. You know what castings look like, right? If it doesn't look like nothing but nice little darling worm pellets, you don't want it. It's I mean, not, you could, it's you not can what you're going to just throw it on the sidewalk. You throw some on the sidewalk and hit it with the hose. And the castings will kind of liquefy and kind of melt off, and you'll see all the other stuff. You know, and you want you don't want all that other stuff in your in your application. Mm. So. Oh, I've been doing worm composting for years, but I just usually let mine go another six or eight months, so it's just nothing there. If it's all castings, you're fine. But if you have on uh, now, you know what castings look like, right? Yeah. If you don't have just castings, then don't use it for compost. It's fine to put in the ground. Yeah. You know. Mm. Um, it's not going to be a problem, you know. The the, the don't life make is going to the tea out. Of it. Yeah, don't make a tea out of anything but castings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, okay, after about a year, year and a half, if I don't change the bedding, maybe mm -hmm. two years, mm -hmm. sometimes two and a half, the worms all die or leave. I've never figured out which, because there's too many salts. They've been pooping in there all that time. Nobody can live in their own stuff, mm -hmm. and they just leave. Mm -hmm. So you have to change the bedding, and I try and do it once a year. And when I do it is. I harvest the castings off it sometime in June, right before we put our winter squash out. And this, the worm compost is darn good stuff. It's got tons of wonderful microbial life. It's broken down well. It just isn't guaranteed to be pathogen free. It goes in every squash hole. Mm. Now, it's, you know, it's winter squash. I'm not going to harvest for 120 days or 100 days. It's been in the box for a long time and now it's in the soil. There's going to be no problem with pathogens. It's not going to be in contact. It only needs 90 days if it's not in contact with the soil. And only that hole is going to have it, the squasher away from there. It's the perfect thing to do. I then, you know, I, I leave, of course, a worm refuge where the food is, put new bedding in. When they move out of the food area, I then take that last bit of bedding. People understand that's, that concept? Any questions and, on that? And we're stepping up a level of concentration here, right? So you could take compost that's four to six weeks old, teach these worms to eat that compost on a regular basis, now you got pathogen kill, weed seed kill. Now you're going to take it even further down to a finer material. Now you've kind of guaranteed that. And now this fine material goes into the next level of stepping up, which is compost tea. So now you're, that super concentrate went through one system, then it got concentrated better in this system. Now that concentrate can go into there. And the bacteria in a compost tea brew, you can get a million fold increase in population in 22 hours. So now you're taking that concentrate and making it into this liquid super concentrate that can go out with water diluted over a big acreage. And that's that synergy I was talking about. Mm. So, what's the optimum temp temperature range for a worm bin? They like 65 to 75. That's pretty they ideal. They into the 80s, but they but generally start to slow they down. They slow down. I've, I've had mine in my basement all winter. So in the winter, it's and probably been in the 50s down boxes. there. Or 40s. It's a pretty regular 60. That's yeah. fine. I'm yeah. sure they're doing good, right? Yeah, they're yeah. pretty happy. Yeah. I stuck one under a dryer vent one time, and I made it through <laughs> two winters. But then the next winter, we had a 
cold too long, cold. it just froze them into a yeah. This yeah. size box, I've been through winters years and years that freeze a salad, the worms are there in the spring. Oh, they just right. all move to the center, they yes. don't freeze salads. You'll see them. Because the yeah. they survive, the there's like a ball, yeah. and that's all. It just yeah. looks like hamburger, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm. Uh, mm. Mm. And so Yummy. I've never taken protein. mine out. You actually, the Chinese are looking at using worms for food at one time. I don't know how they're going to get the grid out of the gizzard. That's what I can never figure out. You know? yeah. Some great centrifuge, I guess, you know. 